Uh, so our talk is from millions of OAuth tokens to GitHub apps. Oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> so first off, happy end of day one. It's been a long day. Uh, a lot of cool stuff. Hope everyone's had a great day. Uh, to introduce both of us, I'll start. I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Chris Holton. I don't like Comic Sans. Josh made me use that font because he didn't really like this picture. I thought um, you looked like a perfect school teacher <laughs> in this picture. This so is I me, thought uh, that's Comic Sans. <laughs> hiking in Scotland, uh, not teaching. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, this is Smith Street in Carroll Gardens neighborhood, which is where I'm from. And I had to pick one picture to summarize where I'm from. I went with pizza. Uh, this is from Lucali, which is a very well-known, very delicious pizza place near me. And I work at Code Climate. And over the past couple years, I've worked on a number of our GitHub integrations there, including uh, listing in GitHub Marketplace, uh, making a permission system that mirrors GitHubs, and most recently, GitHub Apps, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Cool. Uh, my name's Josh. I did not go for Comic Sans. Uh, oh, that, there goes a the battery. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Nope, and there goes the remote. I thought it did, but... Oh. Yeah. So I live here in San Francisco. I'm from Wellington, New Zealand, just to make it as remote as possible. Yep. I work at uh, Travis CI, so the big mustache that helps you build your, your, your code. Um, Travis is a Berlin company. I will, you know, from what we know of Berlin, it's filled with a lot of history, a lot of dance clubs, a fair amount of, uh, let's just say, walls. And I will thank Germany for David Hasselhoff. If it wasn't for the wall coming down, David wouldn't be the star he was today. So thank you, Germany, for David Hasselhoff. All right. I'll stand back over here. So the three main takeaways we want people uh, to learn from this talk today, the first is GitHub Apps is the best way to integrate with GitHub. We're going to start reviewing uh, the OAuth app integration, explain some of its limitations, and move on to a summary of GitHub Apps and how we implemented it for both Code Climate and Travis. Uh, we want you to take away that migrations have some complexities. So if you're starting from an OAuth app, moving to a GitHub app, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. Hopefully you can learn from the things that we went through as well. And lastly, really just let's work with GitHub to make it better together. GitHub Apps is relatively new. It's evolved a lot with us and early implementers. So just keeping that in mind uh, going forward. So first, let's talk OAuth. Um, OAuth, people have probably heard of, are familiar with. Uh, it's a spec related to authorization. There's been a couple of versions. Um, and the way GitHub has implemented it is you can create an OAuth application, and you can have a user authorize that application. You'll get a token back, and that token can be used to access GitHub data on behalf of that particular user. Um, the access level is determined by the user token scope. So scopes can be something like user email or organizations or repository. And those really limit what that token can do. And whoop, authorization is, we're just getting the, uh, we're good? All right. Yes. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> And authorization is based on the user's accessible resources. So if I authorize the repo scope for an OAuth app, uh, it's pretty much with excluding third-party OAuth access restrictions, it's going to have access to what I can access, all of my repositories. So given that, there are some limitations with this OAuth app framework. So one is that tokens can be revoked or suspended at any time by a user. Uh, they can go into their profile settings, they can revoke a token, and your application generally won't know about that until it goes to use the token and get some sort of exception. Um, the management of which user token to use is complex and unreliable, so if you have an integration that's really application-focused and you have a bunch of user tokens, knowing which one to use, who has authorization for what, uh, which ones are revoked, can be very challenging to work with. 
Uh, and many scopes include both read and write access. The repo scope is a big one. Uh, many integrations need access to some aspect of your repository data, and the scope provided repo scope is both read and write, so you can end up over-requesting permissions. Uh, every what, authorization is individually configured, so each person's OAuth token uh, is separate. You might change your OAuth uh, scope, everyone has to go in and reauthorize. You can end up in a situation where some users have given more scope or less scope than others. And OAuth doesn't include the concept of event hooks, so that'd be something like wanting to take an action uh, when a user commits. Uh, to set that up, you have to use someone's OAuth access token to make an API request to the hooks endpoint, and it's really tied to a specific user rather than your application itself. So, I will now tell you more about GitHub Apps. Uh, so GitHub Apps, for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, it really shifts the focus from the user to an installation. So it provides a way to access GitHub data on behalf of an application or installation itself. Uh, and the way it does this is through short-lived refreshable access tokens. Uh, your installation will first, it's a two-step process to get these tokens. It will authenticate as itself using its private key and a JWT token and then it will, as itself, uh, request a token for a particular installation. And then that installation token comes back. It's valid for a period of time. You get a, a token expiration date associated with that. You can cache it until then. Uh, and that's the way that you really interact with GitHub as your service rather than a particular user. The access level is determined by the app permissions. So rather than this idea of scopes, uh, when you set up your GitHub app, you specify exactly what permissions you want it to have. They can be much more granular, they're read or write, uh, and they break down repository to things like pull requests. So if your application needs to read pull requests and write to commit statuses, you have the ability to do that. You don't need to worry about these tokens being in different states. Uh, and authorization is based on what repositories the app have been installed for. So this is another big difference where the users specifically choose what repositories they want your app to be able to access, rather than the very broad uh, OAuth access. And with GitHub apps, you can interact with GitHub as a bot, which is what I've been talking about. And primarily, that's what you'll be doing. But there's also a way to interact as a user. So if you have an application that has user management aspects as well as something that's doing kind of data crunching as the application, uh, you can do both. And that's what I'm going to talk about in my section on uh, how we use this at Code Climate. So Code Climate, uh, for people who don't know, there's two main products at Code Climate. Uh, people who've heard of Code Climate probably think of our quality product. Uh, this one's been around for about seven years, and its main uh, goal is to help developers write better code. So it integrates with linters and test coverage tools, and it helps uh, integrate with pull request workflow to make sure developers are merging maintainable, uh, well-tested code that adheres to their team's styles. And it was developed as an OAuth app integration, and it has a lot of integrations with GitHub, logging in with GitHub, uh, webhooks, kicking off analysis when people push to the master branch, uh, cloning repositories using OAuth access tokens. So we were pretty deep in OAuth territory, um, and we saw a lot of those limitations that I mentioned earlier about integration sometimes breaking or not really feeling like uh, they're integrating the correct way. So. Moving on, our newest product, Velocity, uh, this got launched this year. And what we really wanted to do with Velocity is take a lot of our learnings from quality and GitHub apps and really start it off as a GitHub app. So to give a summary of how Velocity works or what it does, its objective is to take a step back from sort of the repository level metrics and look at your entire engineering organization and the health of your engineering team. So, how often are developers merging pull requests? How often are they uh, reverting pull requests? How long are they waiting for review? Things like that. And it interacts heavily with GitHub. Uh, it queries a lot of repository data using GraphQL to build out all of these metrics. And it pulls often for a feature that we call real-time risk alert. So if you open a pull request and it starts to generate a lot of activity, uh, that's something that we want to notify your team of so it can potentially take action as quickly as possible. And so we need to pull often and keep this in mind uh, when we tell some tales later on. Uh, this, is, this sort of interaction pattern is going to come up for us. Uh, it was originally implemented as an OAuth app. So right around the time we started it, uh, which early this year was when we were learning of GitHub apps. And as you can see here, the uh, 
scopes that we are requiring here, it's repository, read and write access, organization admin access, there's a lot of things that we needed just to be able to do this reading of GitHub data, but there wasn't really a way to say we only need read only. So this is what it looked like before. Um, we decided to migrate to the GitHub app. Uh, Josh will talk about his experience at Travis later, but for us, since it was a relatively new application, we didn't have a ton of users or organizations, we felt like we could actually ask everyone to migrate over and we could do that uh, without needing to maintain both. So the way that worked, we added all the code for being able to refresh the access tokens, uh, for listening to installation webhooks, things like that. And when we were ready, we just replaced our OAuth client ID in secret with the GitHub app client ID in secret. And so the next time users logged into Velocity, they saw a screen like this, and only the only user thing that we're asking for here is email access. So it's a huge difference from before, when the first thing you hit is basically granting all your repository access here. It's just your email. Uh, and this, the installation, is really what we're talking about earlier. It has very targeted read-only permissions. The users can specify exactly what repositories they want Velocity installed for. Maybe they don't want to use it on their personal repositories, but they do for their work repositories. And the permissions list down at the bottom, it's only read access and uh, on the specific resources that you know, make sense with what Velocity is trying to do. Uh, so that was a big win and advantage for us. And one thing to keep in mind if you are doing a migration is you need a plan for Maybe lazy is a bit harsh, but users, you know, there's this step where now that they've authorized with the GitHub app, they also need to go and install the GitHub app for all the repositories that they had authorized previously. The app installation is what has those permissions to read pull requests, et cetera, to crunch the data. So really throwing uh, CTAs all over your application, indicating what repositories need to be installed and, and providing links to go install those on GitHub's end uh, is a way to help with that. And one other thing that we did was we actually kept the OAuth tokens around. So we kind of used a fallback strategy where we tried to use GitHub app installations. If there weren't any, rather than break, uh, we use the OAuth token. And that way, once people have fully migrated over, we can clear out those tokens and consider the app uh, fully migrated. So now I'm going to hand it over to Josh, who will talk a bit about his Travis experience. Cool. So you might all kind of know of Travis from this badge that you'll come across in a lot of readmes saying build is passing or failing. Well, there. oh, there. So a lot of Travis is built on events that are coming from GitHub. So you push a commit to your repository, they'll tell us, we'll run the build, and then we'll do various actions afterwards, like we'll deploy to Heroku or we'll send a Slack message. In the pull request flow, it's very similar. Pull request is opened. We're going to test it. We're going to say that everything is OK to merge. We're going to say it's passed. You can merge it in. And you might be familiar with one of these screens if you're using open source or private, but we allow you to test against a lot of different complexities, a lot of different variations and uh, different versions of your language or maybe operating systems. <laughs> so Travis is enabled across about 1.2 million repositories. This was a couple of months old. We've got, or we run 6 million builds a month, which is 15 million tests or jobs per month. And that, at a peak time, will run about 4,500 VMs when we're running people's jobs and you know, concurrently at the same time. Essentially, what Travis is about is reliability. And why I stress in this reliability is any change that we make to our system, if we stop your tests from running, that's breaking a contract. You expect CI to be reliable so you can be confident in what you're merging in. So what you may not know is that there are two websites. We've got TravisCI.org and TravisCI.com. .org is for our open source and .com is for our private. So we didn't really want that long term. This is a bit of a history thing. This is a whole nother talk in itself. What we really want is TravisCI.com for your open source and private. But to get there, we have a bit of a journey. Now, a bit of this started with a phone call. It started with a phone call from GitHub, and they said, hey, we've got this new Checks API. We'd love you to get on board and use it. And we saw this as a great opportunity. Well, Checks API, as you may know, this new tab in your pull request, and it can show you rich information about a job that or a build has passed or failed, or about what's happening with your code coverage and your complexity. 
and it looks a little bit different in that UI in the pull request you know, uh, UI as well. So you're, instead of having the slashed approach, you've actually got the GitHub app name and what we're running. So we saw this as an opportunity to marry together our private and our public, to have this one platform. But to get there, there's really the UI UX flow. And this is what I'd like to talk about specifically. Before I mention the UI UX flow, any GitHubers here in the audience? Oh, I do love you. Just please be aware of that. Also, everyone here, just remember those hands that are going up, because they're the people to talk to when you've got a problem. Yeah, Brent is a perfect person to talk to. So in the UI UX flow, we'll look at what it looks like on Travis first. So on the old system, which is what we've kept with TravisCI.org, now this is a way of pushing people to .com. And in part because in GitHub Apps, we don't have a way of saying in that select your repositories list, you can only select public or you can only select private. It is just you can select anything. So what we wanted to do is we saw this as a perfect opportunity to say, let's move towards the, the one platform. Now, on .org, you've got these switches, and we would use the API and your OAuth token, and we would enable a service hook. Now, in the new way, we have to actually do a redirection to GitHub for authorization. So you'll click on the Activate button that's, that you'll be on the Travis organization, and you'll come to GitHub. And in GitHub, you've got two options. You can select all repositories or select. This is both a blessing and a curse. The blessing is, on a security standpoint, it's great, because organizations can decide what repositories you can see whenever you're talking to GitHub. You could have a super secret, I've got a mega space program that's going to take over the moon repo that you don't want your integration to see, and you can just not give it access to it. That's perfect. The trouble is that a lot of people just select all repositories because they think this is about giving access to the repo instead of actually authorizing that repository to use the service. It, it's this bit of this mind shift of great for security, but it's a little bit misunderstood. And that's a problem we fell into. So a lot of people will first have to decide, am I doing this for all of my repositories or just a couple? Next, they'll come back to Travis. But we have to process a webhook in between. So have we processed it in time? What repositories were activated? Do we list some? Do we list all? And then if you click that Manage button in the top right that you'll see there, it will go to one of two places. If you're a member of the organization, you'll go to the screen where you can suggest changes. So I can suggest that I want to enable this for all or I can suggest another one or two repositories. Or if you are a manager, you will, are owner of the organization, you will come to this Manage page. And it looks a little bit different, but what we found is whenever you have that Manage button, it will always select all repositories by default, and in part because of the joy of URLs. Because there is no URL that you can send a member to and then have them go and have a suggestion and then have another one for, well, technically, there are two URLs you could use, but then you have to keep track of all of the members that are owners of the org. And it gets complex, and it gets harder to actually make sure it's a reliable way of going through the flow. So what we did is we hijacked the URLs, and we found that if you always suggest, use the suggested target ID, which is the GitHub owner ID, so either the user or the org, and you use installations, new permissions. If you're a member of the org, you'll get the suggested screen. If you're an owner of the org, you'll be redirected to the installation manage page. But you will always be shown the selected all by default, which people get confused by. Click save, then it changes everything, and everything blows up, and then they email you that something's wrong. Essentially, the redirects and the UX is a bit janky at the moment to handle. So Brent, if you could get this fixed, it would be really great. Thank you. Another thing is that you have to keep track, or there is no way, actually, to keep track if an event has been processed yet. So when that redirect happens, you just have to wait a period of time and hope that everything has been processed by your system, that the event came quickly, it was processed quickly, there were no delays, there were no errors, great, it just works. 
and there's no event ID that's passed to you for you to then track if an event came for you to process. But all in all, GitHub Apps has actually helped us move towards a single platform. When we first launched our integration, now these two lines, the green and the blue, green is our old service hooks. This is coming into our application that is processing all our hooks, and the blue is the uh, GitHub Apps listener. And what you'll see in the very beginning or end of August, beginning of May, we announced this to everyone that you can use GitHub Apps and have one just TravisCI.com. And we had a fl few flowing in, a few people started migrating. And then on the 7th of May, GitHub announced Checks API, and it exploded. So within about a week, we were processing about the same amount as people started transferring and integrating over. And then at the end of the month, the end of four weeks, we we're already at double what the service hooks was doing. And this is the last week. In the last week, now service hooks is about 5% of what we're doing. So it's actually helped us move towards a much more reliable system because of how tokens work, how we can listen to the events, and how we don't have to find a random user OWASP token for talking to the API. To date, and I just checked this about 20 minutes ago, we have over 50,000 active installations between organizations and users on TravisCI.com alone. Of the events that we're processing, 83% of them, 84%, I'll say 83.5%, are coming from a GitHub Apps installation, while still 16% are coming from webhooks. And that's the problem. There's a long tail that you'll need to address, especially when you're dealing with large migrations. And this is what happened, what we saw in about April. Uh, April, May was the actual dip. You can see that activity on org dipped, while on .com it increased. And that's the eventual goal of this. We want to transfer the load over. But we want this to be mostly invisible to users. We don't want them to have to have the rug pulled out from them and just have it be weird and complex and not work. And as well, organization usage has increased and dipped and increased and dipped for users. What we wanted to focus on needs to be opt-in. So moving from OAuth to GitHub Apps does require people to accept and opt into it. You do, though, have to force the new way. If you say, oh, you can keep the old way or enable the new way, no one's going to go for the new way. They want to keep the old way working. You have to help you know, lead them, guide them, hold their hand through the process. And we've still got a much bigger issue to tackle, which is GitHub Apps OAuth. Now, that's how you can have people authenticate to your GitHub app. And it's kind of like that mixture of OAuth and GitHub Apps, but we haven't got there yet. So we've got through a part of the problem. I think we're probably about 20% of the way through there with 80% of the work done. It's just more of helping push and guide people. But, but before we end, we just want to tell a couple of tales of two major, I guess, uh, learnings that we experienced during our migrations. So rate limiting. Let's go back to uh, velocity. So velocity is querying using GraphQL, tons of information about people's activity in GitHub. Uh, their pull requests, pull request review comments, uh, commits, regular comments, et cetera. And we're trying to do that frequently so that we can keep those real-time risk alerts useful. One big difference when we switched from OAuth to GitHub apps is previously when we needed to make a request like that on behalf of an organization, we would pull someone's user token. So organization of, say, five people, each token with roughly 5,000 requests per hour, or in our case, GraphQL points, that's about 25,000 GraphQL points you get per hour. So compare that to with GitHub Apps, uh, the installation itself has its own rate limit. So while that makes sense, the jump from switching over immediately, our rate limit went way down from what it was before. And uh, we really felt like we weren't even sure if we could switch over and not run into all kinds of issues with the status is not posting, you know, up to date, and things like that. So the first thing we really needed to do was understand our GraphQL usage. And that maybe sounds easier than it is. Uh, when your queries really get complicated, and this snippet here is only 
5% of one of our more complicated queries, uh, it's really hard to look at it and figure out, uh, there are formulas based on like, how many n plus one queries there are, like roughly how many GraphQL points you're using, but we really couldn't do it. We, we tried to look at ours and we just couldn't figure it out. Um, so what we actually ended up doing was, we use the rate limit object in GraphQL, so that'll return uh, the cost of each query, which is particularly useful for us, as well as things like when you can retry the query, the rate limit reigning, but we really use the cost, and we logged for every organization you know, what queries we were making, uh, how expensive they were, how often we were making them, and we ended up with a very rough equation for how many GraphQL points we were using per hour uh, as a function of the number of repositories in that organization. So, we looked at what we would get with GitHub Apps, and we thought, well, we found there would be some difficulties remaining on our limit if we just immediately switched over. Um, one cool thing that GitHub Apps does have is a sliding rate limit. So if you have very large installations, uh, you get an additional 50 points per user or repository once those numbers grow to 20 or more. But that's still not as much as a handful of user tokens. So while that is great, it wasn't enough for us. Uh, Conditional requests is also a great way to limit how many requests you're making. So that would be things like using e tags or last modified. Um, unfortunately, that's not really an option for GraphQL. It's not supported. But if you're using the REST API, that's a great way to do that. However, that also has the complexities of you need to keep track of the response, you need to keep track of those tags, et cetera. So those were options for us. What we ultimately ended up doing was taking advantage of a few other uh, strategies. One was relatively simple, but once we had that equation for how many GraphQL points we needed, we knew what sort of uh, rate limit adjustments we would get based on how many repositories were installed. We just adjusted our frequency so that it would fit within uh, those bounds for an average uh, organization size. So that would be something where we were still running quickly enough where the notifications would be useful, but maybe instead of coming 10 seconds after the pull request is opened, it's one or two minutes. Uh, but that allows us to not hit these rate limits every hour. Uh, another was to just expect rate limits to happen and handle those exceptions. Uh, the retry at field that you get is useful to know when to re-enqueue a job. So just expecting that, uh, dealing with it like it's a normal use case, and trying to prioritize your work such that maybe backfilling that you know will happen after, so the rate limiting is less important. Um, and lastly, webhooks are a great option if you don't need to do any kind of querying and you can get all the data to take an action based on a webhook. Uh, something that we, I don't know if we mentioned or we may have glossed over is that GitHub apps, they come with webhooks uh, are really built in. So when you set up your app, you can specify particular events that you want that app to listen to. So that can be pushing to GitHub, opening pull requests, things like that. And you'll automatically get those webhooks so they can be used to help uh, keep your querying costs down as well. All right. Actually, it's perfect timing that Chris said that because one of the important parts that was a little bit glossed over, as you're right, is that there are, there's a kind of a breakdown in a GitHub app. You've got events and permissions. So specifically, on the permission side, you've got repository permissions. These encompass probably about 20 different permissions, which are read, write, and of course, no access. So whatever you ask a user for, it's kind of like a contract. You're saying, this is what I need from each of the repositories that you give me access to. Could be the contents, the checks, administration APIs, but these all map to the V3 and the V4 APIs. There's also user permissions. So these are specific with those user tokens, I, well, the OAuth tokens when you use the GitHub Apps OAuth, like what are my emails, what are the followers I have, the GPG keys, again, all mapping to APIs. And then finally, is the, uh, the events. So these are webhook subscriptions that are set up in the GitHub Apps UI for when you create one. So everything that you subscribe to, you will get a webhook for. If a check suite is created, if a branch is created or removed, or a push or a pull request, you can choose. Now, the big difference is, though, changes to events, like what you need, don't require user permission or any intervention. You can sign up for a little, and then you can sign up for a lot, and then you can tweak it down and remove it, and users won't care or know about it. But any changes to permissions, and more specifically, any additional permissions, not removal, but additional permissions, require user acceptance. 
So this means that if I then decide I need an organization hook, I need read-write access to that for my application, you, uh, GitHub will send an email to all org admins and then say, hey, or org owners, and say, hey, this has changed. You need to go review it and accept it. Now, this is usually fine for small teams, small companies. It's not really that great for large teams, large companies, because imagine you're IBM and you've got, you know, you know, several hundred or several thousand people on the, your account, and then an email is sent out to the org admin. Are they going to know who changed it, why it's changed, who's using it, what needs to happen? So a lot of the time, those emails can get glossed over. When they click on the link, they'll come to a, a screen on GitHub and accept the new permissions, and then great, you've got the new permission. But as I was saying, what happens what happens when users ignore those emails? What happens if a new feature requires a new permission and you don't have access to that permission yet? So we recommend store locally within your own system, store what permissions each installation has access to and gracefully degrade. Because when you change and a user takes a long time to accept that change, you're not going to have that new permission for a while. Additionally, remind, remind, remind users. Put that in every UI that is needed to, well, you know, whenever the user uses your application so they know to upgrade. Don't let them take months, have them take days. I think it's the difference between iOS and Android. iOS, when you get a new version, you get like most, 80% like of phones have that new version installed within like a week. Android, it takes years. But that means a lot of the time your application is going to have to know when it can or can't use a permission or a feature or a new improvement. So we're at time. I, I've heard every other room, I think, just finished. So I think it's time for us as well. Um, to recap, GitHub Apps is the best way to integrate your service with GitHub. We recommend it. It's much better than OAuth. I love all the security. But migrations when you're a large application are more complex than starting fresh. We've, you know, the, it's a big difference between having 1.2 million OAuth tokens and having a couple of hundred. Right? And the only way that we can improve GitHub apps is by talking to Brent <laughs> and getting, well, hi, Brent. So the only way that we can improve GitHub apps is together. If you're running into a problem, you're running into an issue, talk to GitHub. Raise it on the forums. If you've got someone that you can speak to, email support, because the only way that we can make them change and you know, help make it better is from them hearing from us. Cool. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, that, was, that was us. Enjoy the universe. <laughs>